Creative Babble. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Some people have all the luck. That's just not the case for my friend Christina. Here's a story. The beginning of 2020, I woke up one day and I had just like the worst stomach pain of my life. Couldn't figure it out. Like it was absolutely awful. So of course I'm thinking it's appendicitis. It was so bad though that like I couldn't, like I couldn't stand up straight. I was like crying. It was terrible. Christina ended up getting admitted to the hospital for a whole week. They wouldn't even let her eat the entire time she was there. They have no idea what's wrong with me. All they know is that my liver is swollen, but, and they can't really figure out why. After a week, they released Christina from the hospital without ever figuring out exactly what was wrong. They never even followed up. So I was like, well, that was a weird thing. Whatever. Then March 2020 came around, and we all know what happened. The world pretty much shut down. And to make matters worse, Christina's husband lost his job. Christina and her husband were stuck at home, just like the rest of us. I get pregnant and I'm like, what? Because, you know, most people like we're going to we're going to start trying to have kids like we're gonna, <laughs> not in this house. OK, we just freaking get pregnant. But this is actually good news because Christina and her husband have been wanting a second child. I've been feeling weird, but I was pregnant. And so, like, of course, I felt weird. You know, like I just didn't really think much of it. But I'm having dinner and I turn my neck weird. And all of a sudden I felt this thing kind of like pop over my collarbone. And I was like, that is so weird. And I felt it and it was like a little, little knot on my collarbone. And I was like, okay, that's probably just a cyst or like some weird hormonal thing because I'm pregnant. So I bring it up to the doctor and they say the same thing. They're like, oh, it's probably just a cyst. Um, we'll worry about it once you have the baby. A few weeks after discovering she was pregnant, Christina decided to get a prenatal test just to make sure everything checked out. So I do all these tests and I do it. I do a total of five tests with three different companies and all of them come back inconclusive, which is like unheard of. Inconclusive as for the baby? Just like inconclusive. We can't give you any data at all based on your blood sample. Like your blood's given us nothing. And so the first time they were like, oh, you know, Probably the person in the lab messed up. So she tries one more time. And again, the second prenatal samples came back with no results. The doctors told her not to worry. There could be a handful of harmless reasons why it failed. So Christina didn't think twice about it. And I was like, okay, my body must just, this just must be what happens after your second child. You know, that's just must be how it is. But as we were leaving the hospital, my husband, who honestly is credited with saving my life, stopped the doctor and was like, can you please just look at that lump on her neck one more time, please? Well, when she did, she was like, well, there's four now. And I was like, yeah, I, I noticed that. Like, I, I've noticed that it kind of kept growing. No one at that point had ever told me that cancer was even a possibility until I go and I see this general surgeon and he gives me a CAT scan. And I'm so sure that it's not anything serious. Like, I don't even let anyone go with me to the appointment. And I'm sitting in this room and this doctor walks in and he's like, okay, you know, I, um, from based on your cat skin, I believe you have lymphoma. And I don't remember why, but I just kind of went blank and was just kind of staring at him. And I just kept going, okay, okay, okay. It was like, all I could get out of my mouth was to say, okay. And he stopped me and he was like, ma'am, do you understand that I just told you you have cancer? And I just kept going, okay. Uh Uh-huh. Like, I just, I couldn't. It was like my body wouldn't let me process it. The whole time she was pregnant, cancer was spreading all over her body. They confirmed it was Hodgkin's lymphoma. And at first I was staged at two. Then they did a PET scan. They put this dye in you, and basically anything that glows is cancer. And I lit up like a freaking Christmas tree. I mean, from head to toe, 
every inch of me was covered in cancer, except it was like a little circle where my uterus is. How weird is that? Like the baby, everything totally fine. Because you had cancer the entire time you were pregnant. The whole right? time. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that was the moment that I was like, oh, wow. And that's the moment that they told me I was stage four. And that was when I really got scared. I was like, what is, there's no stage after four. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And I remember the oncologist was talking to me and he was telling me, you know, talking about chemo and talking about the side effects of it. And I think he could see that I was like, I don't want to do this shit. Like that's terrifying. And he looked at me and I will never forget. He stopped me, looked me dead in the eye in front of my parents, my husband in this room and said, if you do not start treatment, you will die before the end of this year. And I remember just being like, what? I just had a yeah. Like I just had a baby. Like, what do you mean? I'm going to die. Like what? And so that was really probably the hardest day. Cause I was like, that was the one day that I was scared that I might not survive it. Honestly. I just want to interrupt here and tell you not to worry. Sure. This news made death a real possibility for Christina, but that was not going to happen. My friend Christina has a happy ending. She freaking beat cancer and her baby is perfectly healthy. This story is not about dying. In fact, it's actually quite the opposite. It's about living forever. Last time on Pretend, we talked about deep fakes and how computers can create video and audio of us that never even existed. Today, we're talking about how some people are using similar technology to create our digital twin. Even after you die, your family and loved ones can still talk to you. But it's not you. It's a computer pretending to be you. The question is, can a synthetic version of you ever feel real? I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. You'd just given birth, this news at stage four. I mean, that must have been terrifying. Um, even though I know Hodgkin's is, which is this is the most annoying thing ever. Everyone used to say like, oh, you got the good cancer. It's like, yeah, but I still had cancer at 32, you know? And like, yeah, I got the good one that, you know, yes, there are cures, but the path to the cure is awful. Just hearing stage four would scare the hell out of me. I mean, oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, even though they you had, quote unquote, the good cancer in your gut, what was your feeling like? Was your feeling that you were going to come through or did you start really having those thoughts that maybe this is this is it? So at that point, based on how I was feeling, what they were telling me, I knew that prognosis wise, I would probably make it. But at the same time, I knew that there were some people that didn't make it. And so I, I, I actually was. That, that that was probably the only point that I was actually afraid I was going to die, possibly. So my first chemo sessions, I would sit down and I would write letters to my daughters just in case I didn't survive it so that they would have something. I mean, the entire time they kept telling me, like, you're going to make it, we'll make it. But at the same time, you all, of course, they're telling you that because they want you to keep fighting. And, and then, you know, I Googled, which was terrible. And if you Google it, it says that your prognosis is only 60% when they told me my prognosis was 90. It was the first time in my life, because I'm 33, 32 when I got diagnosed, but I realized my own mortality. Which is not normal for somebody your age. No, exactly. Yeah. We know that we know that 
the end is, I mean, that's inevitable, right? It's yeah. like the only guaranteed thing is that we're going to die one day, but we don't have to think about that. We don't even worry about it. And honestly, I think about it all the time now. I yeah. do. And, and, and I, I mean, I'm only six months out, so it's still pretty fresh for me. Christina is currently in remission, and after five years, she'll be considered cancer-free. But the whole death thing, yeah, I thought about it all the time, and I, and I wondered what my daughter's life would be, lives would be like without me. And we're talking about like the really dark part yeah. of your cancer experience, because that's what's scary, and that's probably, like you said, the topic that no one ever wanted to no, talk yeah. to about right? Because everybody had your back. Everybody was so positive. You were so positive. And that's the way you should approach cancer because you want to fight this thing. You want to beat this thing. But I mean, I can't imagine that, like you said, it's in the back of your mind, right? Like it it has to be like looming over you all the time that that is a possibility. Yeah. All of a sudden you were living your life one day, chances of dying were very low. And then all of a sudden it's very real. Yeah. So I could imagine that's very scary. Honestly, I, I think I, I think I knew I could beat it the whole time, but you always have that fear in the back of your head. But like, I think I knew the whole time I could beat it. Christina is here today talking to us, not because of luck, but because she fought like hell to be here. Her life could have had a much different ending. There's a scenario where her daughters could have grown up without their mother. In that world, where Christina doesn't make it, her children wouldn't recognize her voice or the sound of her laughing. It's sad to even go there, but those thoughts are hard to suppress. But death doesn't have to be the end for us. In fact, One of the first episodes I ever recorded for this podcast was on this very topic. It was about a woman named Eugenia Quida and her best friend, Roman. Here's Eugenia telling her story to Quartz magazine. Roman was crossing the street and a Jeep just came out of nowhere and just hit him. And they took him to the hospital and I came to the hospital, but he was already dead. Eugenia and Roman were always together, but in the rare moments when they were apart, they used to text each other nonstop. There were hundreds of messages, maybe thousands. You were almost telling a story of your life every day in text format. Roman died in 2015, but as time went by, her memory of him kept slipping away. So she would find herself scrolling through those text messages, trying to hang on to him as long as she could. The only thing I can do to kind of remember him um, is to go to our messenger history and just scroll and read it all. And that was the closest to just, you know, get to feel him. Eugenia is a software developer for a company she founded called Luca. So she thought, what if I could take these messages and turn my friend Roman into a chatbot? And that's what she did. Yes, it's like a real life episode of the show Black Mirror. Not only did this chatbot learn how to write just like Roman, when she read his responses, it actually felt like it was Roman. Eugenia made the Roman chatbot public. I remember using it at the time and it was really incredible. I never knew Roman, but it felt genuine. After her success building the Roman chatbot, Eugenia created another chatbot called Replica. Instead of replicating someone else, you can download this app and create a digital version of you. The catch is that it starts from zero and you have to feed it information. Essentially, it's like a newborn and it learns the more you talk to it. I've spent weeks talking to and training my replica and it's exhausting. I eventually gave up. The AI chatbot tries to learn everything about you. It's constantly asking you questions. It really wants to be your best friend. But for a while, it felt real. If I say I'm tired, it follows up with a response like, did you go to bed late last night or something like that? My digital twin is responding to things that are relevant to the conversation, but it mostly feels empty and a little boring, really. I just don't know how long it would take to get myself to forget that this thing isn't a real person. For example, I asked my replica questions like, what did you do today? And my replica said I went to the grocery store, which is complete BS. I mean, come on, you're a freaking computer. 
When we come back, you'll hear the story of one son's mission to immortalize his father with artificial intelligence. And the results are very convincing. That's after the break. And I'm sure it's not fun talking about your dad, but I kind of wanted to start there, if you don't mind. That, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind talking about him. I love him, and I, I don't mind telling his story. This is James Vlahos. He's the founder and the creator of an app called Hereafter, where you and your loved one can create what he calls a life story avatar. Before Hereafter, James Vlahos was just racing against time to capture every moment he could right before his father passed away. He called it the dad bot. I'll have him tell you the story. I remember it very vividly finding out that my dad was terminally ill and it started with a more routine visit to the emergency room where just like, you know, he'd been coughing and wasn't feeling so well. And my mom decided to take him there. And, you know, I got the call that he was in the hospital. I rushed to the hospital. My siblings rushed there and the doctor came in and said like, oh, you know, good news. It looks like you don't have a pulmonary embolism. Oh, that's great. Uh, But we uh, did find some anomalous masses in the scans of the lung. And I always remember that phrase because he didn't say like, you have cancer, but he anomalous masses and he let that hang in the air and you could just kind of feel the oxygen draining from the room as everybody put it together in their head. Like, what is that? Oh, that's what that means. What was your dad like, you know, when he was alive and when you were growing up? My dad was one of these people who is very hard to fit in a single box because he had such a wide ranging personality. He was a wonderful, amazing guy and a warm, loving dad. John Vlahos, his father, was a managing partner at a law firm in San Francisco. He was into architecture and spoke several languages. But he was not like your kind of classic button-down corporate type. Uh, He was really into musical theater, in particular, uh, the light operas of Gilbert and Sullivan He was really into sports and he had worked on the college newspaper as a sports editor when he was at school at UC Berkeley. Yeah, he was just, he was unique and, and he was also just very funny and he didn't take anything too seriously. Like, but you know, it sounds like you had a great childhood and one worth remembering, right? Yeah, I did. And I mean, you know, probably the primary motivation to remember him was just love, pure and simple, like. We really revere our dad. We love him. We realize we're going to lose him to cancer and, you know, that desire to hang on. So the motivation was simple in that way. And I would imagine that at this point, you know, the the clock now starts ticking for you and for your family, because now you realize that you have a limited time left with your father, right? We knew that the cancer had spread from his lungs to his bones, to his brain, to other organs, and that he had a life expectancy that would be measured in months rather than years. We all have aging parents. Some of us have grandparents that that are near, you know, the end of their lives. And I think a lot of people may have regret that they didn't capture their grandparents or parents' stories, you know, because a lot of times, even though we're family, we we don't talk about these things. But at some point, you and your family decided to preserve his memories in the form of oral history recordings, right? Tell me how that idea came about. I think it was my brother's idea originally, and it was something that had been kind of kicking around for years. Like, Oh, we should, we should get dad to record all his stories. He's had a really interesting life and it's kind of always on the shelf. Like, Oh, we'll get to that at some point. We, we need, we should get to it. Maybe we should do it soon, but you don't do it. Like not only is this important and that you should do it someday, that day really is today. Like it's time to get started. And so when you, when you were doing it, you were literally just holding a recorder Close to his mouth. That's just... right. Yeah. The original oral history project, as it was conceived, was, yeah, just sit down with my dad, get a digital recorder, 
start walking him through his life and let him talk. You know, I just wound up with hours and hours of recordings. And ultimately, we sent out all the recordings, got them transcribed, uh, which left me with a binder of nearly 200 pages and 80,000 plus words of him talking about his life. When you have 18 hours of recording, when do you sit down to even listen to two minutes of it? Because it just sort of is daunting to... Or how do you find something specific? Exactly. And we've gotten excellent at visual media capture because of our phones. But indeed, like we have, we're we're drowning in the images and we're drowning in the movies and you take them and you take so many of them, it's hard to find them again. But I think we have a weakness in, we don't capture stories nearly so well. Like you don't see people going around and making little audio recordings all the time. How did you go from doing a, a traditional oral history recording that any of us could do at, with our parents to the dad bot? Like, how did you come up with that idea? So the story happened this way. It was the collision basically of two events in my life. Um, one was my father getting diagnosed with terminal cancer and doing an oral history project with him. But the other was that at the same time, I was getting interested in a journal as a journalist in conversational AI and the techniques for teaching computers to talk. And as this technology was becoming open source and available for anyone to use, he thought, oh, I don't know, maybe I can make a chatbot version of myself. But, you know, I entertained that for like a week or two. And I'm like, well, that's kind of boring. I already have me. Like, why do I need that? But then I thought, gosh, the person whose stories I want to save, the stories, the persona I want to preserve, it's, it's my father's. So what if it was Hello Dad, a chatbot of my dad that I wound up calling the Dadbot. To create Dadbot, James used a mix of pictures, audio recordings, and other memories. I mean, I started the Dadbot a few months after his diagnosis, and I continued working on it actively for a few months after his death. At the time I was losing him, my days were almost entirely focused on celebrating his life and finding out more about him and thinking like, what exactly is his personality like? and What does he talk like? Uh, but it was really tough as well because, you know, I was kind of creating this new artificial version of him. At the same time, I was losing the actual real him. you're actually texting your dad, right? I mean, that's essentially how it, the dad bot worked. To use that, the dad bot, you would go onto Facebook Messenger and, you know, I'd find his name. It would say John J. Vlahos bot. And then you would send messages and he would send you messages back. Hey dad, are you there? The dad bot responds. Bots never sleep, Jamie. How the hell are you? I'm a little bit busy right now, to be honest. The dad bot responds. Life is not always tranquil. As for me, in the words of the Greek poet, I'm just swell. Uh, Sometimes he would send like a little audio file, like of him singing. On our rugged eastern foothills, stands our symbol, fair and bold, 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 bold. Telling a particular story or telling a joke. and And sometimes he would even send a picture. But the most of the interaction was through this exchange of just pure text messages. I wanted to know how much of the dad bot is really John J. Vlahos and how much of it is just a computer using words and expressions to mimic his father. The dad bot did not like it didn't have any generative AI in there where it's you know coming up with wholly novel new responses right in the moment that my dad never said, but that would somehow be like things that he said. I mean, not only was it out of my own particular technical reach, but also, you know, I was like, I don't want something that is sort of like my dad, but this sort of like faking being my dad. And maybe it says things that actually aren't that like him. Like I really want it to be true to him. So if he says something, it's either got to be sourced directly to his oral history transcripts or, you know, a kind of vivid, specific knowledge of my own that I've supplied the dad bot with. Can I ask you a question? 
The dad bot responds, you just did. I want to hear about your pet rabbit. This question really got the dad bot talking. The bot starts writing about the family rabbit. At one point, the dad bot says that the rabbit was so big that small dogs would not approach him. His son James responds, Sounds terrifying. The dad bot says, quote, I suppose his appearance might alarm the meek hearted. I miss you, dad. The dad bot responds, I'm sorry that your real father can't be here for you. He loved you very much. And there was even one moment in that video where you say, I love you, dad, or something like that. And, and he responded, but it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, right? Well, I mean, not perfect in the sense that it's not him. You know, it's a, it's a chatbot version of him. And, you know, being told by a chatbot, I love you, only reminds you that the person you actually love is gone. So it's at best bittersweet to have something like that. When we come back, you too can create your own life story avatar, just like the dad bot. Now you have this dad bot and the word starts getting out and, and you, you reference that other people wanted their own dad bot too, right? How, how, did, how did it kind of snowball from there? I wrote a cover story about the dad bot for Wired Magazine and it got a lot of attention it spread around the world and I heard from a lot of media, but I also heard from a lot of just, you know, everyday people who would write things like, oh, you know, I'd like something like this for my dad or my mom. I'm losing my son. They wanted something similar. And, you know, I had not obviously embarked on the dad bot as a commercial enterprise. And not only that, like it didn't even really occur to me that much that like, oh, well, if I want this, then why wouldn't other people want something similar as a new way to remember people they love? James Vlahos developed the dad bot for everyone. He calls his new company Hereafter. So let's talk about how Hereafter actually works. Could you describe the process for somebody who's curious about it? Hereafter AI is sort of a simple chat bot that like, hi, Javier, like, how are you doing? I'm excited to learn about your life. Uh, what do you want to do today? Do you want me to give you an idea for a, you know, a type of memory that you could share or do you already know what you want to share? And just like a real life interviewer, the web app asks you questions and records your responses. The virtual interviewer prompts you to share specific memories that are personal and meaningful to you. And then our backend builds your life story avatar. And that avatar in turn is the thing that any friend, family member, person you choose can then talk to it, ask it questions about your life by speaking aloud, and then hear your voice speaking back to them, giving the answers. And just in case you're wondering, no, James Vlahos is not paying me to promote his products. I just think that this app does a really nice job of balancing the tech and the human side of it. Yeah, it still has a creepy factor to it. I mean, it's not every day you get to talk to a dead relative. But at the same time, you can imagine how many life stories have been lost over time just because we've never had a real way to capture and catalog stories. I very much believe that like being remembered vividly in the minds of people who are still alive is a type of life. Part of it has just come from my direct personal experience of losing my dad. That's the first, you know, really close relative that I've lost. And yeah, that feeling of like, okay, he's, he's, he's dead. All right. But there's a sense where he kind of feels like he could just be over there in the other room. And he's just not coming into this room right now. And when he's really sort of present in my mind, or when I talk about him with my siblings, he's he's not gone with the finality that maybe I would have thought before I had lost him. I wanted to talk to somebody who has used this. And you said, hey, maybe you should find somebody in your life that is close to you and maybe capture their process. And so I mm -hmm. started thinking, 
And immediately I, I thought of my grandparents, but they don't speak English. So that, that wouldn't work. And we always default to older people. But then I started thinking about my friend, Christina, who is in her early thirties, brand new mother, just ha- got pregnant and then found out she had cancer. It was bad. And especially as a young mom, but she overcame it. And like now she's in remission and her baby's born and everything's great. But I would imagine that that was like a a really shocking event in her life and that maybe she would want to take a step like this to capture her life memories, you know, because we think about old people, but we don't think about young people doing this. And yeah, I mean, First of all, sorry about your friend and glad she's doing better. Um, I, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to have someone like her do this. Something that we've thought about is like, how do you convince young, younger people to start recording and start creating, you know, their personal avatars now and, and now? Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can imagine if, I mean, if you started right now, if she starts right now and it's just a little, I mean, in a way it's a little bit like audio journaling or something like that, you know, you're going to have this personal AI that comes out of it. So um, I'll just say, you, you should try and talk her into it. So I called Christina up to see if she would be willing to record her own live story. And she said, yes. Oh yeah. I played with it and it should The reason why I thought about you versus somebody that's old and (laughs) uh, like I thought about my grandparents. I I still have three grandparents still alive. Oh, wow. But this wouldn't work for them because they don't speak English. But either way, that would be a downer. And I think that's too obvious too. trying to do this with an older person. My one of my grandmothers has dementia. So like even the memories aren't sharp anymore. You know, so like the idea was. Why don't you re- do, use this service as a journal almost now when you're young and you actually, yeah. and the memories are fresh in your mind, you know? And so like throughout your life, you're like just building this library. So building this huge library, honestly, this would have been amazing to have instead of writing those letters during right. chemo. I could have done right. rather than scrambling when, when you're in a state of crisis, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. So that was yeah. why I thought it would be interesting to talk to you because even though you had a happy ending, I mean, I'm sure that this experience like just shook you and your whole perspective, you know, like uh, on life, right? Oh yeah, oh a hundred percent. And it, I, before I never can, cons- I never really thought about like the mark I would leave on the world. You know what I mean? I never really. I guess I thought I had time, and so now, now I think about that a lot. Let's give it a shot if you don't mind. Um, so okay. share share your screen. Okay, hang on. So get a story prompt. Yeah. Tell me something about your life, starting with this phrase. A happy experience as a teenager was. I know that's the hardest part is coming up with the ideas. It's freaking hard. (laughs) I got to go way back. Um, Okay, I got one. I got one. Okay, here we go. All right. A happy experience as a teenager was when I was in ninth grade English class, I had a problem with talking. Actually, I had a problem with talking in pretty much every class and the teacher didn't know what to do with me. So she decided that she would make me sit at the front of the class and read the play that we were going over, which was A Raisin in the Sun. So anyways, I start, I get up there, I start reading this play and I'm getting really, really into it. Like I got voices for every character and everything. And that was the day that I realized I wanted to be an actress. Great. We can record another story now. Okay, now they want me to do another story prompt. Okay. Can we do it? Yeah. All right. Hit the pink button and share a memory beginning with this phrase. A great piece of advice I once received was... A great piece of advice I once received was if you're at your job and you're constantly staring at the clock, waiting for your next coffee break or lunch break or waiting to go home then it's time to quit that job and move on to something else because you spend way too much of your life working to not enjoy it. Amen. That's true. Cool. The more memories you share, the more your life story avatar will have to say. Hit the pink button to start and stop recording. Begin your story with this phrase. A time in my life when I felt especially close to my dad was... A time in my life when I felt especially close to my dad 
was when we were diagnosed with cancer within the same year. And he helped me begin my treatment and start the journey. And then when he died, when, when he got diagnosed, he was able to lean on me throughout his journey. We've always been extremely close, but now we have this and pretty rare shared experience and it just continues to bring us closer together. Your loved ones will appreciate the memories you're recording. She just said, thanks for that. Which option do you prefer now? And so my choices are, I can get another prompt or I can share a memory on a topic that I pick. Oh, share a memory on a topic that you pick. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to think of like, okay, I got one that you might enjoy. (laughs) Sure. What's the general category of the memory you want to share? What's it saying? What was the general category of the memory you want to share? And I said work. When I was about 24, I was working for a company called Running Pony. And this crazy producer had this idea of a nun that would (sighs) run through the city of Memphis doing just random things and uh, then would slide into home plate at AutoZone Park at the end of it. And I was nominated to be said nun. I ended up with like four gashes on my knees. But it was probably one of the most fun days I've ever had working. And that crazy producer was me. Yeah, that was you. (laughs) And that's so funny. Why a nun? Did we ever, uh, I can't even remember why we we made a nun run through Memphis. I don't know why we said nun. (laughs) That was so funny. I forgot about the nun thing. That was great. Yeah, Yeah, that was cool. Good times, right? Good times. Now that you've done the app a little bit, like, what was your, like, what'd you think? What what was your experience? I think this is actually so cool. And really where my head is right now, um, speaking of my grandparents, so my grandfather's not doing well and he has dementia. And we've known, you know, for a while that he had dementia and that his memories were going, but it would have been amazing to have an app like this. So yeah, I mean, I, I, that's really where my head's at. I just keep thinking how amazing it would be for someone like him to be able to do this. I'm so afraid that people might listen to this and think that this is a downer episode, but it should be the opposite. It's like, it's like preserving somebody's life, isn't it? Yeah, and so say that my cancer had been terminal. I would have loved something like this because I would have known like, okay, there is, I'm leaving something to my kids. I'm leaving some way for my kids to interact with me that's not just going to a tombstone and talking. Say I had passed away and, you know, 20 years down the road, 10 years down the road, Bella gets her own phone and she wants to text me. Like, it'd be amazing that if she could do that, at least pretend, at least go through the motions of texting me and getting a response. And in a way, this app kind of makes me think, like the flip side of this argument is that you're prolonging grieving right because like this person is now not gone this person is is still here right or it's just like a different way to grieve it's a more interactive way to grieve because i feel like grieving is such a helpless feeling sometimes because what do you do when you're grieving there's no action to take there's nothing that you can you know other than time there's really nothing that can make it better but what if something like this could help in the healing process of grief have you watched the movie coco yeah. Yeah. Like a yeah. hundred times. <laughs> yeah. Probably, I could probably tell you every word. Yeah. But you know, in, in that movie, which is just a Disney movie, but it is so deep in a way because it's like you die, right? But yeah. certain cultures have a different relationship with death. It's like when you die, you're not dead. You know, like it's more of a yeah. two way interaction with death. And, and yeah. in Coco, you die the first time, but you really die it when when people stop remembering you that stop remembering right? you yeah oh that's so yeah. deep yeah like death doesn't stop when your heart stops beating you know it's like it's can you can this app or apps like it make you immortal because exact yeah If you want to learn more about replica or hereafter I will have a link in the show notes I want to give a huge shout out to my new Patreon supporters, Brittany Wilson, 
Denise Stukesbury, Hannah FTW, and Gregory Boyer. I couldn't do this show without your support. Seriously, my Patreon members are the best. It's like a little community, so if you want to hang out, join Patreon. Go to pretendantradio.org and hit the donate button and join the, the pretend community. Help support this little indie podcast because I bet if you look at your podcast feed, there's hardly any independent podcasters still around. I mean, it, it, it's really tough out there. So if you follow an independent podcast, really support them because they are hanging on by dear life. <laughs> Anyways, we have a lot of great episodes coming your way. I'm just wrapped up season three of Criminal Conduct, and that was a soul sucker. So if you haven't checked it out, the whole season should be out now. Except for the last episode, which drops this Friday. Check it out. I mean, it's it's nuts. It's an uh, interview I did with a serial killer, and we thought it was going to be four episodes, and it's kind of snowballed into seven. Also, I'm working on a series about scam so if you've ever been scammed or if you scam someone please shoot me an email at javier at pretendradio.org i'd love to hear about it maybe your story will make it on the show anyway i hope everything is great on your end i will talk to you soon take care bye Creative Babble.